strikes either side. <laughs> Amazing. You don't know, but our office is in Euston is um, it's surrounded by a lot of the union buildings. I'm very supportive, don't get me wrong. But when the news came out, the Transport and General Workers Union is literally across the road. I was screaming through the grass, not the first, please, not the first. Um, there we are. Then we did the poll and... Well, 92% of you said, go ahead, we'll get there somehow. Well done. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I, at this point, I do have to thank the minibus drivers. <laughs> and the car shares, and uh, David, who ran the car share spreadsheets, and all of that. I'm, I kept saying, I'm not a driver, I don't understand, I'm a cyclist. Um, and I, did, I even got a train up, I didn't even get in a, a car share, so that was me. But my God, well done for doing that. Thank you for your support, obviously, for this, but also for the sector, um, by insisting that we do this. Um, that's incredible. Maybe I should turn that one off? What do we think? Yeah, maybe that's a bit better. Cool, right. Well, this is um, a Reconnect, which is our first uh, conference since 2019, when we were in Coventry prior to Coventry being City of Culture. And um, so that's why we've called it Reconnect, because uh, for many of us, we haven't had a chance to get together, but also many, uh, particularly with our friends from Bradford here, we've got many new friends to reach out to, and that's absolutely brilliant um, to have that opportunity. Um, and hey, Bradford Cathedral, thank you for last night. That was rocking and wild. And it felt a little bit wrong. <laughs> In the right kind of way, he said. Um, and uh, so, of course, we're, we're here, we're, we're visiting, pre-visiting yet another city of culture. We've done this with Hull, we've done it with Coventry, and now it's absolutely thrilling to do it. And well done, Bradford, for getting it together. Um, so, with a bit of Bradford in mind, I'd like to start by welcoming um, Sarah from Bradford Council and Ned from the Cathedral to give us a little Bradford welcome. Come on up, please, Sarah and Ned. So, I think I would have put the microphone back on. Bye. You know what to do. It's your, it's your guest. Gentlemen, thank you. thank you, thank you for a warm welcome. But I would like to welcome you all here. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> welcome you all here today. Um, and actually, we've got a bit of sunshine, so that makes it better. Um, it's brilliant to see so many of you here in Bradford. I've recognised quite a few faces, but I've just been speaking to some people from Scotland and down in Bristol. So welcome everyone. Uh, as you can see, Bradford is a diverse place. We've got a wonderful backdrop and scenescape, uh, and I'm sure that Shanaz is going to talk uh, in length about our UK City of Culture, which is absolutely fantastic. And I know that you will all support us in our endeavours when we deliver in 2025. So welcome, enjoy Bradford, get out there and uh, round the city centre, out into some of the towns and into uh, the villages and the landscape. Got some brilliant things to see. Welcome, thank you. Much, thank you, and Ned. It's uh, a privilege to welcome you into this space, uh, Bradford Cathedral. Uh, I hope many of you who came last night had a good time in this beautiful space. Uh, we are proud that this has been uh, the oldest site uh, where we have welcomed and gathered people from all over, different cultures, languages, faiths and none, into sharing common moments in life, everyday moments, and of course, moments of the sacred, the transcendent. Uh, we do what Peter Brook once said, making the invisible visible. Uh, he was obviously talking about a stage, but here at Bradford Cathedral, we're very much in the business of holy theater and theater the holy. Um, you're welcome. My name's Ned. I'm uh, very recently, although I've been working at the cathedral for some months, uh, helping them in preparation for the City of Culture. This week on Tuesday, I was officially installed in that seat there as a permanent member of staff. Um, my title is Canon for Intercultural Mission and the Arts. I'm the only one in the country. Um, <laughs> it means... No, thank you. We do things differently here in Bradford. Um, my job is really to take a lead, not only for the cathedral, but for the churches and the faith community across this district to engage and continue the great heritage of engaging in intercultural dialogue and events and activities, and as well encouraging those faith communities to engage with you, the arts and culture sector, 
not only of the city, but uh, nationally as well. I'll talk a little bit more later on about our offer to you uh, in these coming, coming years as we prepare and deliver, and of course, as we keep saying, beyond City of Culture uh, in 2025. Just to turn slightly to the sharing the everyday moments of life. If you need the toilet at any point during today, <laughs> seamless segue. Um, it's just at the back, past the shop, turn left. Um, they're, they're all there. If you could avoid the corridor just beyond, don't go to the toilet in that. Um, but that's where the staff work. They're very friendly, very welcoming, but there are a lot of you, so don't all go and say hello. If you could avoid that, that would be great. If you need anything during today, find me. I'm in a bright red suit. Or Phil, who's in a slightly dulled checked shirt at the back there, or one of the verges, will be able to help you in whatever way you need and assist in that way. Um, we're not expecting a fire alarm, but if we have to evacuate the building at any point, if you could just stay still and quiet, listen to instructions, and leave by one of the fire exits as directed, that would be great. As you navigate outside, particularly as it's wet, be careful of the older parts of our site, which are slippery when wet, so please be careful in that. And do remember, it's a no-smoking site for a whole load of different reasons, so it would be really helpful and kind if you need to smoke, just to leave by the gates and, and, and then do that uh, there. Just one more thing, um, and this is maybe a bit about sharing in sacred moments in the transcendent. It, we've got lovely spaces uh, of peace and refuge and sanctuary. You're welcome to use them. The side chapels just down here, we've got three of them. If at any point during today you just need a breather, you need some time just to be by yourself, reflect, or if it's your tradition to pray, you'd be welcome to use those. Please, if you do, go in there, just respect those spaces and the people who might be using them. Just be respectful of uh, whatever people need. And my personal offer to you, all through today, if you need anyone just to share in that moment, to sit silently with you, to be with you, maybe you're going through some stuff that you need to process and you'd appreciate a friendly ear, I'm here for you, just come and find me, ask me, I'd be privileged to sit with you in whatever way you need uh, as we share this space in this day to day. Um, I hope you have a really in inspiring and transformative day. Welcome to Bradford Cathedral. Thank thanks, mate. thanks, Sarah. Brilliant. That's amazing. Hey. What do we think? Am I too far forward? Do you think? Yeah, let's go back a little bit. Hi, right. Well, brilliant. Thank you, Ned. Thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here. We do feel very welcome, and I can write. Hi, guys. This is the speech. It goes like this, okay? <laughs> this is hilarious. This is the bin. Right. Welcome. Lovely. Done that. Happy Bradford. Lovely. Toilets and... Uh, oh, yeah, we've done all that. Thank you. Save me all of that. Our venues are Bradford Cathedral, um, Kalasangam, where you will hope to have registered and grab coffee. We're also, later on in the day, using the Light Church, which is uh, a rival place of worship just over the road. Uh, if you go up to the uh, cathedral gate, it's, at, like, it's just literally across the road on your left there. Um, we, there is another quiet space, as well as that very kind offer from Ned. We do have a quiet space in Kalasangam that is also streaming this. So if you want to go and watch and not be in the big room, you're most welcome to go there. Great, good. So, here we go. What's the theme? So, um, we are an Arts Council England-funded investment principle support organisation. And like many of you, had to write uh, an application to be an investment principle organisation, and we struggled with the phrase investment principles. Um, and I then took the investment principles in my head, thought of them as lovely values that we all work to, and then it was much easier to write. So we're a lovely value support organisation. Um, there are four of them, and we're working through them year by year. That was part of our application. And so the first one is ambition and quality. So that's very much what we're focusing on today. And when I got together with uh, members of the board to talk about what we were going to do here, we talked about that ambition and quality in relationship to partnerships and in relationship to how we work together, that that is how we can be more ambitious and we can raise the quality of our work. So that very much is the theme today. So we've asked our speakers to talk about being in partnerships, how they work together. Uh, we've got many different scales, huge great national events to tiny, tiny neighbourhood events that all involve partnerships and involve outdoor work and involve some great inspiring stories, I hope. I've asked the speakers mostly uh, to stick to 15 minutes and do no audience questions. Audience questions will happen. They will happen at the end of the day over in the Light Church. So you will have a chance to follow up uh, when you make the choices about what that 
uh, what you want to do towards the end of the day. I'll just talk about the end of the day. So it's organized that we break out for the last two hours, and it scares the pants off me because it means that the end of this conference is unscheduled and open. I like everything to be in nice boxes telling me what to do. But we thought we'd leave it open. Uh, one thing we've done is there's a thing called Open Forum, uh, where there are things that we will obviously not have on the agenda that you will want to talk about. So please, uh, go and sign up at reception if you've got a topic there. Alan will be, Alan who's on our board from Surge in Scotland will be leading those sessions and he's got a very good way of doing them that they end up with action points. There will be four topics discussed. Uh, that will be up in the clock tower, but you need to put your topics down and then um, Alan and Camille will be supporting him as well. We'll work on what we talk about there. Uh, so that's one of them. The other sections, the Q&As with our speakers from in here over at the Light Church. They're in hour long blocks, uh, three, three sets of speakers in each. Uh, and then we also will have in here, now this is all going to be a bit grisly, yes I know, we have uh, producer programmer speed meetings. So I'm going to ask anyone who's a producer programmer to, to be in that session. That's the first session of the breakouts. And we'll do a quick, what we want to do is have you sat at a table or at a chair and just meet as many people as possible. I'll be in and chair it and it'll be a mess and it'll be a bit chaotic. But I just, it, it came out of the survey, what do you want in this? Everybody said we really want to just make those connections. We're talking about building partnerships, so please play ball with that. I know it's a bit grim. Um, we've got the marketplace. I'm so happy to see the marketplace back. I love the marketplace. Not everyone loves the marketplace. The architects find it a little awkward at times. It's not the best way to show your work necessarily. But it's a great place to, do, to go and meet new people, do a bit of shopping if you like. Um, and that will be open from one, and we're just going to keep it open. So if during the afternoon you've had enough in here, or you don't want to go into a breakout, we'll also have a bar open over there as well. And if you want to have a drink and just wander around the marketplace and talk to your mates, or just to hang out, it's completely fine. I'm like that a bit with conferences myself. So if you want to just relax in that, that latter part of the day, that's completely fine. Um, there will be no judgment. There will be no judgment. Uh, uh, yeah, and the bar was quite, it's the same people who did the bar last night, so it'd be rather nice. Uh, the GNTs, I believe, were excellent. Um, so uh, that's, that's what we're doing in the afternoon. So it's all a little bit free form, but we also have an ideas pitching session that will be back in here, where anyone who's not in the marketplace or has got an idea rather than a show to sell, Something that they want partners on, collaborators, commissioners, funders, well, we want all of those things. Rehearsal space, they want people to work with, they want artists to work with, they want designers. If you've got an idea, just pop up, we'll just have that open mic, um, Sarah Bird's going to chair that for us, and you'll just pop up, say, you know, in a couple of minutes what your idea is, what you're looking for, and then we'll have a little mingle and people can hopefully make some of those connections. So it's, those last two hours are all really open and really scary to me. So that's kind of how it works. Um, oh, look, I've done two in one. Uh, also, our friends from the Arts Council will be doing some one-to-one -one sessions, uh, 20 minutes. Uh, you can sign up for those again at reception. Sign up for Ideas Summit, sign up for um, Open Forum, and sign up for Arts Council one-to-ones. Um, and especially, I, I'd really like to encourage people who are new to Arts Council funding to sign up to those. And if you've, if you've been around the block a bit, maybe you step back this time. Entirely up to you. Your call. So, uh, what was I asked to do? I was asked to celebrate when we talked about this. We were celebrating being Bradford. Yay! And then uh, that's what we're talking about, reconnect. Celebrate ambition and quality, make new partnerships. And then, maybe. Right, a summary. <laughs> 2019 to 2022. Anything happened? So that hilariously is me in, uh, in Coventry saying, oh, it's all going to be marvellous, isn't it? We're going to have a great time, nothing around the corner. Brexit seemed a bit worrying, but that was the worst of our troubles. So what's happened since then? Well, I've lost a bit of weight and I've shaved, so that's a, that's a good start. Um, however, right, COVID. So we have to talk about it, but I'm going to try and put as positive a spin as I can. And I get, those, I get those emails and tweets saying you're well, far too positive, but there we are, we'll go for it. What did we learn? Um, it was scary as hell, wasn't it, when it all began in so many ways, personally and professionally. What I saw was an incredible resilience from this sector that was so different to many other sectors, even within the cultural world, yet alone beyond that. Um, it was extraordinary, the responses of how people pivoted so quickly to do different things, to support each other, to create those ridiculous communities on Zoom. Dear God, how joyous is this, not being on Zoom? Actually, when the strike came on, someone said, oh, why don't we do it virtually? No, not in a million years, not anymore. Uh, but however, we were part, I was part of many different communities. We ran several 
online sessions, uh, several hundreds of online sessions uh, to, to reach out. And people were so brilliant and so generous and so supportive. And this sector was absolutely brilliant with the rest of the cultural sector, reaching out, telling them how to go outdoors. And people were really helpful. And then I, I was getting theatres and concert halls coming saying, can you help us? Yes, well, I can. I can tell you who can help you. And everyone was so incredibly generous. And the support that they off everyone offered each other was, I was, it was so beautiful and moving to see. And I, you know, I will always, always be so impressed. Um, that first, the first when it was all hitting, we were at um, Walk the Planks, brilliant uh, venue in, in, in Salford, uh, f and I was visiting the NASA event. Um, and we were, and well, that all fell apart. We just talked about about what was around the corner, uh, and how we'd respond to it, and then. On the one hand, it was like, well, this will be the end of capitalism. Yes, excellent, didn't quite happen. Um, but also the fears around what people were going to do and how they would be. So I have to talk about something that happened, which happened in my bedroom at my office, when um, the then director of, the Co of Combined Arts in the Art in Arts Council in England phoned me and said, uh, we're going to put some emergency funding out to um, freelancers in the outdoor arts sector, do you think your organization could handle that? And I said, yes, sort of, yes, yes. How much would that be? How much do you think? And I'm ashamed to say, I said, w w would 50,000 be possible? She said, are oh, they going to start at half a million? And I said, okay, we can handle that. And um, didn't know that we could, but of course we could. And uh, that came, and I've got to say how amazing it was to work with Arts Council on that, because they were so hands off. They asked us how to distribute it, how to reach out to the sector, what the qualifications would be, and with some light checking, they left us to our own devices to do that. And um, we were able to give away every single penny of that to people. It was, it was the best job of my life and the worst, because it was awful reading these people's applications. I like reading, you know, funding bids for shows, not for what, what was troublesome for people. And suddenly kind of running a benevolent charity. Felt, I felt like a sort of Victorian lady. Oh, well, you're worthy. And it was awful, and yet also brilliant. So I'm so grateful for that. I'm so honored to have been charged with that. I can't tell you. Well, yeah, you know what I mean. I'll get over that one. But thank you to the Arts Council for that trust and for that money. It was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, God, it was a challenge. But it was amazing. So that's is that COVID dealt with? Yeah, we're marvelous. We're on. Moving on. Oh, Brexit. <laughs> okay. So, oh, happy Brexit anniversary. Three years, wasn't it? Um, so I just, I just read that um, uh, the European Union just upped the cultural fund by 160 million euros, and we're no longer able to qualify for that. And um, that's amazing. And... <laughs> The touring possibilities, get on the Extracts website. They've got some amazing resources about how people are working around them, talk to each other, amazing stories. Motion House were brilliant right at the beginning. Other companies have been amazing at finding ways of doing it. Uh, I, I know some people were in Freiburg recently. I think Public with Guts and Show Globe were there. Um, and we were in Tarragon, and it was wonderful to get that support from our European colleagues. Um, but, oh my God, I'd, I read this terrible thing. The music industry, um, there's a website called um, Dress to Impress, no, Black Dress Code, where musicians go on and buy their formal wear for playing concerts, uh, and it's completely closed down because the demand is no longer there from the freelance musicians, and also for the, webs for the, the, the uh, retailers, they can't reach out to Europe anymore, so they've gone defunct. That's not our sector, but it's quite interesting to see the supplier chain there directly impacted by this. Um, and as I read stuff that um, people are saying uh, from, from on high about how it, it's all, it all the pastures will be green again, um, let's just work together to make that. I can assure you from going back to Europe, it was wonderful going to Tarragon, my first trip to Europe since pandemics uh, and Brexit, and just feeling that support. They do still want to work with us. Partnerships. Yes, partnerships. Uh, we've worked particularly with uh, an organization called Carry On Touring, and I just kind of want to thank Jolly Vianne, Abby Collins, Andrew Loretto, Mimbra, Charmaine Childs, who all contributed to that on their online blog. Um, and it was great. It was mostly musicians, but we had a really good presence. They were really open to us. 
And they invited me to go to the House of Lords with them and talk about this. And it was the day before I went to Tarragon. And I, I, I really spoke passionately about how amazing it was going to be to watch um, Joseph Tunga's show in Plaza Mayor in Tarragon. And it was. It was incredible. And it was just made one so proud. But I was able to talk there. The you know, House of Lords, they all nodded and agreed. And that was amazing. Uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes, eh? But carry on. Carry on. Carry on touring. That's what they said. It was amazing. Um, so other things that have happened in that interim time. Well, there was another City of Culture. Oh my God, I felt for Shanine and her team when City of Culture 2021 became sort of 2022-ish and they were rescheduling and suddenly it was things going on. But thank God so much of it was outdoors because that meant that could all go ahead. And they were very generous with us and they, they, they supported us doing a massive great festival focus event out there. That was incredible. Um, so well done to them for getting through that. That's the opening ceremony that was, I remember, live streamed. I remember watching on breakfast TV rather than being there as I would have expected. Unboxed. Let's just mention Unboxed. So Unboxed famously at one point called the Festival of Brexit. Um, and of course Martin Green took over and made sure it wasn't called that anymore. I was dreading a jingoistic flag waving uh, affair and I'm pleased to say it wasn't that. So I think that was something that they managed to dodge really well. And also, Martin is very, very clear about how much of that money that was allocated and going to be spent went to artists on the R&D and the actual delivery. Um, it's now being used as a kind of punch bag by the politicians about how we spend. Uh, but I'm glad a lot of that money that was going did end up in artist pockets. Um, and also, it was amazing seeing an outdoor arts company on Country File for half an hour. That was incredible. Um, it was really wonderful. And you could just see my shoulder, back of my shoulder, as I climbed up a mountain with a lamp. So well done, Walk the Plank, for getting that together. That was uh, incredible. And I know some people didn't engage at all because they couldn't bear to, and that's fine. Um, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in two minds. Um, oh, yeah, Jubilee, then. So <laughs> there was, uh, I've also got here, we spent a lot of time in this period going on to our, rescheduling our tweets about go and see this show because of COVID restrictions, Storm Eunice, the heat wave, the looming threat of royal demise. Do you remember that? Waiting for us there. More on that one later. Um, but hey, the Jubilee. So I got a call from Adrian Evans, pageant master, saying, can you give me a list of all the outdoor arts companies who might be suitable for this kind of event? I sent a very long list. And it, uh, it, it, was, it was wonderful. I know many in the room. Trigger, Shademaker, Emergency Exit Arts, Nutcut, Hiccopy, Mahogany, Mandinga Arts, Bridgewater Carnival, Global Grooves, Kinetica Blocko, Oi Musica, Imagineer, Highly Sprung. Uh, ooh, what's that say? Uh, something is it? Kinetica, Tuneful Jean Charles, right in the last one, as I recall. Um, it was amazing. So I, I supposed to go into some posh bit and watch it. Didn't get in. They couldn't find where I was supposed to go in. So I just went onto Birdcage Walk, right towards the end. Uh, there was a bit of room, and the crowd were there was you know, a good crowd there. And by the end of it, they went, "Who are you?" Everyone's waving at you. Who are you? And it was brilliant because everyone was a bit tired. It was the end of parade. They were like, my God, you're still here. And, but what was interesting, I had these interesting conversations with the crowd saying, yeah, these are artists and they're paid and they're commissioned and they should be. Oh, they're not just volunteers. So I ended up kind of giving a lecture <laughs> on the structure of arts in this country. But it was brilliant and it was fantastic seeing people. And I was sort of trying to spot people and shout out. And they, the crowd just thought I was nuts, but that was fine. Um, I also got, at one point, I got stuck when the military bit was going past, not my favourite, but I, they were really, they were like, they stay in character, their costumes are immaculate. <laughs> they're drilled, their choreography. It's like, actually, guys, take notes, they know what they're doing. Uh, anyway, Royal Demise did happen when we were in Tarragon, and suddenly all of the group we were in Tarragon were like, oh my god, I've got a boogie next week, oh god, when's it going to be, when's the funeral? Um, you know, it, it, it was, it was inevitable. Thank God we got through the Jubilee. Uh, but it was like, oh, another thing. Another thing. Great. All got the coronation date in your diary? We know what to do. Just be prepared around that. Um, so, ooh, hello. Okay, MPO and funding. Um, so, there was a big funding round. Obviously, it was a year late because of the extension um, due to COVID. Uh, and so, it's now for a shorter period. And the MPO, some shifts in that. Obviously, the interesting questions, I know our Arts Council colleagues are struggling with some of the stuff that went on there, not least of all that delay. It was awful for all of us waiting. I know it was awful in the Arts Council offices too, I know. Um, that sudden delay to that. Uh, look, so we did a little bit of analysis. 
Uh, roughly 13 million was invested in outdoor arts before it went up to 19. We make that 7.5 of the allocated funds in the NPO, National Portfolio Organization. Um, and so I just kind of want to point out, this is the image for Let's Create, the document that we were all writing to, a strategy uh, about how the arts will move ahead. And if you've read it or dealt, you know, talked about it, you'll know that we as a sector deliver this in spades. That image is Company Artonic, a uh, French company, uh, the show Color of Time being performed in Hounslow as part of Bell Square and the Hounslow CPP. It could not be more us on the front. In fact, 11 out of the 21 images in Let's Create are outdoor arts events. And I'm just going to say, and 7.5% of the allocated funding. Now, you know what I'm saying. There's some really good results in project funding. Uh, extracts have done some of the analysis of that. So it's, you know, it's not just within that. Uh, it's very important. But I just want us all to work together to up that percentage and that involvement because we are, as a sector, delivering on that. And I, you know, I'm very, very proud of that. But let us just work together on that. Um, there were 12 major new uh, outdoor arts specific organizations that went into the portfolio. There were many uplifts for them. Um, but I've got to talk about one. I've got to talk about, you said, Hat Fair. Hat Fair, uh, the longest outdoor arts festival in the UK that lost its funding. And the really important thing about that is we are such a delicately structured network. You pull one of the things apart and it's a problem. And Hat Fair has been there for so long, it's led the way. It really led the way as a festival in coming out of pandemic because it's early on in the schedule and it showed us. I went there, you know, filming saying, this is how you do social distance. This is how you wear a mask during a show. It, all of that. They were fantastic about that. Led the way. Also, they have a unique place within our sector of having the busking and hatting community alongside the funded sector. It's, we always go as an organization. It's because it's where we get the widest reach. They are working like hell to make sure that the festival goes ahead in some form this year. So I know we will all work together to support them on that. Thank you. Now, um, so well done to them. Um, so working together, embrace its future, yes. Uh, there were some other losses. There were some companies who were here as well. There were many gains as well. And there was the redistribution out of London, which part of my joyous job is that I get to travel across the country. So I'm very, very pleased to see some of that happen. Some of the way it happened was curious, um, of course. There is a lot of room for more there. Uh, the other kind of one little thing I'd like to just add to that is about um, is the phrase outdoor arts. Now, I, we changed the name of our organization with Arts Council, uh, much Arts Council uh, discussion about this, and I'm still determined to try and get it on the list of art forms that the Arts Council England supports. It's there in Scotland, it's there in Wales, Ireland's pretty good on it. Come on, let's get up, let's put us along there. Opera, ballet, theatre, literature, Libraries, museums, outdoor arts, please. We're doing it, so help, help me on that, please, ladies and gentlemen. That's my calls to arm. That's done. Um, fantastic. Uh, so we've also been having some um, healthy discussions uh, about, uh, uh, with, uh, with Out Walls, talking with NASA, with us, about uh, transparency, about funding, and it's been brilliant to have those conversations. They've only just begun, and they are ongoing, and they, they, they came out of uh, something that happened in Stockton, and conversation started. We're very, very um, pleased to be part of that, and we will continue uh, to do that. Um, and we'd love to see more commissioning funds coming in. Uh, we've sort of lost GI20, I don't even remember that, Circulate. Uh, commissioning pot. Um, we've now got the four nations commissioning pot that hasn't got England funding in it, so it's the 3.2 nations or something, which is a shame. So we do, do need that lower level uh, there. Uh, a few uh, moving talking, so I'd just like to, a uh, couple of nods to Stella Hall having moved on from Festival of Thrift. Um, Charmaine Child, strong lady. You know Charmaine? One of my super buddies within the sector has been, I've known her for, what, 15 years. And she's Oh, she brilliantly said, well, my body's not as strong as it used to be. Uh, so she's going off to Australia to become uh, uh, the touring manager of Circa, one of my favorite indoor companies, and, and also taking Sophie, her wife, with her. So we will miss her. Um, Wally Range All-Stars performed their last gig um, in Wally Range. Of course they did. Um, that was very sad. And um, 
And Maggie has now stepped down from Without Walls. We'll still be working with Extracts. And uh, so we welcome a new director there. So there's quite a lot of change going on. Um, and another company that had its last performance was The Desperate Men. So this is a little moment we do. Uh, we'd like to just take a little time to talk about some people um, not with us anymore. So how nice to be in a cathedral for that. Uh, so Dave Toole, many of you know, will, will know Dave. Dave was a dancer, had his legs amputated when he was very, very young, uh, worked largely with Stopgap, also with Kanduko, and famously with uh, DV8. Uh, was a grumpy old sod. His last tweets on Twitter are furious, uh, and that's great. There he is in the Paralympic um, uh, opening ceremony, dancing, where he famously flew over the arena eventually. Um, that's him dancing in Stopgap, uh, I think it's at the South Bank Centre. Uh, a great character. I once uh, shared the uh, disabled space with him on a train. I sat on the floor uh, when there was no, no seats. He said, come sit next to me. We can put the world to rights. Uh, a wonderful character um, and a great, great artist. Simon Byford, production manager. I didn't know him. Simon uh, recently worked on Imagineers Bridge. Uh, in, in back to the old days, worked on Streets of Brighton um, and was a very popular Production manager, there he is with a crane. That's what you want to see a production manager doing. There he is during the, uh, some of the campaigns about freelancers, uh, freelance production manager. So that's Simon. Um, uh, now, I didn't know uh, Danielle Orove at all. Uh, interestingly, so Carol, uh, who we've just met today, uh, one of her first experiences was with, with Daniel. He was a street clown, um, very, died, died very, very recently. Um, uh, by all accounts, a real character. And it's interesting, some of his last Facebook uh, posts are about someone else who sadly left us. Um, that's how I do my research. Rick Taylor, well, you'll know Rick as one of Gran Turismo, uh, and that was uh, uh, quite some time ago. Uh, and uh, yeah, the grannies are still going on, but uh, sadly without Rick. And then most recently, and, and perhaps a, you know, a, a real big figure in our world, was John Bedell of The Desperate Men. Um, and John, again, someone, one of my early bookings was The Desperate Men's Miracle Show, gosh, 15, 15 odd years ago, and John uh, is, Obviously, very close to Richard, who is here, I'm really pleased to say. Um, and uh, this was, I think, my favorite show, which was uh, Slapstick and Slaughter about the First World War and, and Dadaism. Um, that's the last show. That is the last show that was in Greenwich and Docklands Festival uh, with the company. And I'm really pleased um, that I was able to be there for that, as long as many of us were. So um, we'll take a little moment. Is there anyone else I've missed? Anyone else that I haven't said? Can I just say? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here we are. There's Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thank you to the guys you've mentioned. Um, thank you to Rick. Thank you to Daniel, Danielle. Thank you to Simon, John, and anyone else who isn't there. Maybe we give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. So, get out of that one, Angus. Whew. Uh, yeah, farewell, thank you. Right, moving on. Honours, meanwhile. <laughs> Royal Honours. This is the, um, the, the queen, last Queen's birthday list. There's Shanine from Coventry. There's Vicky Della Amedame from Upswing. There's Govinda Sander from Cohesion Plus. There is Gina Virgin Charles. There is, uh, there is Martin from Tin Arts. There is Jenny Seeley. That's fantastic. That was all in one shot. Well done. Uh, also, there, Dave got one just before he died. Thank God. Well done. Good timing. Verena Cornwell, now currently director of uh, Kensington Chelsea Festival, and Tarby Davenport, uh, a legend of asset, also there. So well done them. Um, yeah, that's not bad. <laughs> Putting our feelings about empire aside. Um, yeah, of course. 
I'll tell you the story. So I take quite a lot of calls about these recommendations, and one of them I misheard, and I went, oh, well, thank you, I'd be honored to accept this. They said, no, it's not for you, it's for someone else. <laughs> I was like, mum, mum, I was with my mum. Other nice things, Chipolatas. 30th, 30th birthday, that's amazing. Uh, Anya Meinhardt uh, of Justice in Motion did a fantastic TED Talk and was shortlisted Dance Award for uh, Women in Dance Leadership. Highly Sprung won a Railway Award for Best Community Event, that's fantastic. Um, Phil Hargreaves on our board, Best Dance Producer. Uh, all sorts of lovely things do happen too. And they also happen to this city that we're in, fantastic. Um, so. Bradford is, uh, we will have a panel discussion about all the different parts that put, pulled together to bring, uh, uh, over the years, that make Bradford uh, the next city of culture. But it's also brilliant for us that Shanaz is uh, at the helm. Shanaz is a local girl, which is a great thing. She also used to be on our board, although we never actually met when you were on the board. We just managed to slightly cross over, but we love that you were. Um, so our first uh, speaker, that's me done. Look, the bin is done. That's, that's it. Woo, got through that. And did PowerPoint. That's amazing. Uh, but first of all, I would like now for you to welcome, we're going to hear about Bradford City Culture from its director. How great to have you here and how great to be in your city. Please come up. Please welcome Shanaz to the stage. Brilliant. Okay, great. I'm one of eight, so I can also shout, but you might not want me to do that. Um, I haven't got a PowerPoint, and I can't follow that performance. <laughs> this is my speech. Yeah. Shows you the difference. Um, I come from Hope. I come from Bradford. That is the opening line of our bid. How could they not give Bradford UK City of Culture? If you look at that image behind me, that's the moment Bradford was named UK City of Culture. I was in Coventry. I was sent to Coventry. <laughs> Everybody else was here having a party, and I am looking at all of you that were here. Um, if you want to hear that moment and what it means to Bradford, go on Google, type in Bradford wins UK City of Culture. There's this brilliant moment where everyone stood there like this, really quietly. And then Bradford is announced, and an almighty roar erupts from our city park. I'm really competitive. So when I was, you know, yeah, all my friends are going, yeah, really? We didn't know that about you. Um, and when we were bidding, for some of you that don't know, I was the chair of the bid. So I was like, how can you create something so brilliant, so fabulous, and then not want to deliver it? It's like handing your baby over. But I remember when we were creating the bid, um, we were watching all our competitors and getting more and more competitive and more and more kind of like, what is truly who we are? How do we demonstrate who we are? How do we kind of say who we are? Um, and a lot of that was kind of spent on Twitter going, okay, what's Southampton saying? <laughs> When's Ryan Reynolds coming to Wrexham? How are we going to get someone from Bradford to beat Ryan Reynolds? We love Durham. They're north. So kind of, that was our energy, trying to, whilst being competitive, also trying to be collaborative and collegiate at the same time. When that roar went out of City Park, you could feel it through the screen. That image says it all. The district was involved all the way through for our City of Culture. There are many differences, actually, for our city of culture to Hull, Coventry, Derry, London, Derry. It's the first time, January last year, we're thinking, OK, city, 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 we're working on this. And then suddenly we're told, actually, we're going to open it up for the expressions uh, in, of interest stage and conurbations of towns, a couple of cities. You can bid for it. I love Lancashire. I mean, you all know about the War of the Roses. I love Lancashire. But they went, you know, we're going to, the whole of Lancashire is going to go for this. I love your ambition, but really? I love the ambition, and I love the, the, the kind of imagination to try and do that. Um, but it meant that we were up against 23 other expressions of interest, which just meant, well, Bradford, we just kind of went like this. We went, okay. So we need to kind of roll our sleeves up and really, really try and create a bid that speaks about us. This conference is one of the first things that we're doing officially 
part of in Bradford. I'm really, really proud of that, and I'm really happy for that, because A, because it's, um, it was about 14 years old, and where's Dusty? There he is. Um, I made a giant puppet as, with my school teacher to be part of the Bradford Festival. So my taste of outdoor art started young and early. It's a space where we have inclusivity, accessibility, Angus spoke about all of the performers, all of the artists. I, I'm looking at all of you knowing when I, ha I have traveled as an artist, the length and breadth of this country, the welcome and the, the kind of inclusion that I have felt. For me and for this district, which is 67% rural, we've got hills, you know that, some of you have had to climb them. We've got mills, we've got estates, we've got streets. All of this is our offer to you as the outdoor arts sector. And I back what Angus is saying about, you know, Arts Council kind of going, okay, can we please add outdoor arts to this list as well, please? We don't have many venues, but that is our USP. That is our challenge. That is our opportunity within our challenge. Many of you know the journey that Bradford has been on. Many of you know that we've had 20 years of going, okay, come on, give it a chance. We can do this. Give it a chance. We can do this. You know what, they've given us a chance, now we have to do this. It's that moment you apply for a commission and you think, I really want it, I really want it, I really want it, and then you get it and you go, oh, no. <laughs> I'd use many other language and words, but, you know, I can't, you know. It, my mother would have words to say to me. Our city of culture sits in the heart of a 10-year cultural strategy. Bradford Council were like, okay, we're bidding for the UK City of Culture. We are firmly, firmly putting our colours, our future behind the opportunity that culture gives us. It's about our artists, it's about our people, it's about our communities, it's about all our sectors. We in this room know the impact of culture. We in this room know how, impact, uh, how culture can change and transform. So Bradford's like, okay, our cultural strategy, next 10 years, we're back in culture. So in May 2021, they launched Culture is Our Plan. If you go online, just type that in, it will come up. And you will see what Bradford Council is committing to. And they committed to this bid pretty early on. So I want to say thank you to our council who have been brave and taken a risk and are working in partnership See what I did there? Thank you. <laughs> In partnership with us to deliver our ambition. So I told you a little bit about the fact that we're different. How are we different? Well, first of all, we're a district-wide bid. So, you know, we've got a Metropolitan District Council. We've got five town councils. We have 30 wards. We have many councillors sat within our wards. And we have cross-party support for our city of culture. First difference. Second one, Angus said, local girl. Yeah, born and brought up. Many of my friends here know, I keep saying, yeah, I'm living in Keithley, I live in Keithley. Why would I leave? Look at that landscape. Look at where we are. Look at the opportunity, and guess what? It's really, really great to travel from. It's really easy. Actually, I say that, I'm coming to our train station later, but, but where I live, it's a really good place to be able to get to the north, to get to the south, to get to the east, and to get to the west. So why would I leave? Look at our landscape. Every morning I wake up to that. But that also means that there's a welcome for all of you coming into our district. Sorry, my, my mind closes, doesn't it? <laughs> um, our city, our people were heavily involved with writing the bid. The bid team went all over the district in order to make sure that those voices were part of it. And one of the kind of the most important things for this district, for this city, is our young people. So we developed four themes. Those themes will help us to create the change and transformation that we want this city, this district, our local art sector, and our national art sector, and our international partnerships too. So I'm going to give you a flavour. I'm going to, no, I'm not going to give you a flavour. I'm going to give you all four themes. So talking about our young people, coming of age. Bradford has the first, only, 
longitudinal study. We have the Bradford um, Health and Research Centre here, and we've got a study called Born in Bradford. 30,000 young people are being um, followed from birth to adulthood, adulthood being 18, and to see the impact of health, education, access to culture, lack of access to culture, lack of access to health, lack of access to great education, and what happens to these young people as they grow up. That's 30,000 of them. In 2025, the first cohort, cohort turn 18. We utterly planned it. We knew we were going to win 2025, UK <laughs> City of Culture, you know, about 15 years ago. They turn 18. This theme is literally handed over to them. It's not by young people for young people. It's by young people for everybody. So they're the future, but they're our future, and they're also our present. It's also Bradford's coming of age. I've talked a little bit about 20 years. It's taken us 20 years to get here. We know, those of us who are of Bradford, we know our history. We know who we are. We know what we've come from. We know those moments when it was, you don't want to go to Bradford. It's a no-go area. It's really difficult. It's really violent. You know, all of those things. We're going, what do you mean it's a no-go area? We have parties and DJs in cathedrals. Everybody's dancing. What do you mean it's a no-go area? There's a great, brilliant cafe that everybody goes and hangs out. We're the only ones, I think, have got a cafe that stays open to midnight. It's a very welcoming, warm, energizing place. Imagine being born and brought up in a city, in a district, where when you say you're from Bradford, that's the response. So you have to own it. You have to make it yours, and you have to be the best ambassador that you can be. So it's our coming of age as Bradford. Um, but I've got a question. How many people here think they've come of age? Put your hands up. I dare you. <laughs> That's my invitation to our young people. You never stop coming of age, ever. Who at 18 had figured out what they were going to do with their lives? My parents tried. It didn't happen. <laughs> we don't. Why is it that we cannot celebrate our coming of age as we get older? Creative aging. We talk about creative aging. It's something I'm really interested in. Not that we're aging, but that our creativity grows, matures, becomes more imaginative, becomes more risk-taking. I was listening to the radio this morning, and they talked about how as we get older, you know, we don't lose energy. Our energy becomes different. That 100-year-old woman um, had, you know, could stay awake beyond anybody else. I mean, she did say that she needs to sleep less because she's over 100 now. And she's got mobility issues, but her imagination and her drive had not shifted or changed. So my invitation to our young people is to say, remember, you never stop coming of age and work with all ages, all generation. It goes back to that phrase of, by young people, for everybody. We're also a city of the world. You know, you're sat in this very, very beautiful space. Some of you kind of have seen and know Bradford and know the mill history, know the wool history. We were known as Woolopolis once upon a time. We still give wool to the fashion industry, just to point that out. We have working mills still in the district. Um, we were once upon a time the richest city in the world. It was that. That's our industry. That's our history. We also are a place and a district that has welcomed people from all over the world not just over the 20th century, but before that as well. I'm only stood here because my parents came here, or my dad did, and he was like, yeah, I'm going to go back at some point. Never. And these links, this history, this is very much who we are as a city and district. It's not just who, those people who have made this district their home. It's what we offer it, what we now give the rest of the world, what we now offer the rest of the world. Which takes me to our third theme, steam-powered. Who decided it was a good idea to take arts out, out and make it STEM? Who decided that our young people in comprehensive schools were not going to get the right to arts, to humanities, to critical thinking, to their imagination? STEM for one, STEAM for another. STEM for the majority, actually. For us in Bradford, it's steam powered science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. 
That's what creates a resilient, robust, imaginative, risk-taking, change-making society. We've, you know, just thinking about Angus's speech and everything we've been through since 2019 and where we've got to now, I mean, I have to say, I am watching the aviation flu just to make sure, you know, who saw COVID coming? It's jumped to mammals, I'm like, I'm keeping an eye on you. So who saw that coming? We didn't see it coming. But we need our imagination to create solutions. We need access to our imagination. Every young person, every person in this room has the right to their imagination. That's what steam powered is. It's about our climate responsibility. It's about sustainability. It's about coming up with those solutions and making those changes and creating that transformation. Talking of transformation, how many people here came into Bradford Interchange? Brilliant. You're amazing, amazing human beings. The rest of you missed out on what I call, very proudly, one of the ugliest train stations in the world. Okay? I am very proud of it because it's really easy to embrace beauty, isn't it? This is amazing. It's stunning. It's beautiful. We also have to embrace that is what is ugly within our society, within our cities. How can you create change if you don't see the opportunity within the ugly? Someone obviously thought that, some, you know, Bradfordian was thinking, how do I shake this up? How do I change this a little bit? So those of you who came in on the train into the interchange, there's a little bit of graffiti. It's not the best graffiti. It was a little bit of a scrawl. I reckon they were running at the time they were writing it. Um, welcome home sexy. <laughs> That's to all of you. Because this district, this city, has been a home for outdoor art for decades. We know this. We know it's the history. We know it's in the DNA of this place. But Welcome Home Sexy, that moment where somebody was like, oh, I'm going to just do that, that's Bradford. That's in our DNA. I think it was Ned who said, you know, I no, it was Angus who said, I felt a little bit wrong last night, but in absolutely the right way. That's what we are trying to do. Might be a little bit wrong at times, and you think, really? But it'll be absolutely right, I promise you. This is my welcome to you. These are our themes. This is my ask of you. We can't deliver a UK city of culture on our own. It's about partnerships. You win the designation, and everybody's thinking, yeah, they've got loads of money, but you have to then prove your business case and your case to all your funders. And that's absolutely right. Because the moment you win, the campaign is done and the delivery starts. I was working out, out the timeline for when you were in Coventry. Um, you all know that Coventry concluded on the 31st of May, 2022. I'll never forget that night. I don't think Bradford will, um, which means we're six months, we lost six months to COVID. In Coventry being able to extend, it goes back to partnerships, collaboration and, and, colleg and collegiateship. Given Coventry that time, we wanted to reset the city of culture back to the 1st of January 2025. We lost six months in giving our colleagues that. We're now 99 weeks away from the 1st of January 2025. If that's making you a little bit, you know, anxious, giving you a bit of a hot flush, we're two Christmases away. It's all about perspective, isn't it? So that's my ask of you. That's my ask of our sector. That's my ask of our national sector and our international sector. This can only be delivered in partnerships. I'm asking you to take a risk with us, calculated risk, mind you, it is calculated, you know, uncalculated risks mean you fall over the edge. Um, calculated risk, they've got friends in, the, friends in the audience who are going, oh God, she's going to do those, one of those batshit crazy things, and batshit crazy ideas. Actually, yes, welcome home sexy. <laughs> but remember that it also has to be fun. We can have fun while doing this. Transformation, change, impact can be fun. We have to create new routes into arts and culture, the traditional routes don't work for a huge, huge sector of, especially in Bradford, our working class communities, doesn't work for us. So we're exploring, as 
Bradford UK City of Culture, roots into arts and culture for our young people who might go, I really like that. I love, I love the fact there's a party going on at the cathedral. How can I join in? I didn't know you could have a party in the cathedral. How can I be a stage manager? How can I kind of be that person? It looks really interesting. I want to be on that stage. I was at um, an event last night where I was speaking to 100 youth workers. And Matthew, I can't remember his surname, he'll kill me, but I'll, he's somebody I need to talk to, but jumped on stage. And he was 14 years old when some youth workers started to work with him, talk to him, trying to kind of give him opportunity. And he ended up working with Matthew Bourne Company. Bradford lad, 14 years old, been dropped out of school. We have a duty of care to our sector to ensure that we have a diversity of voices. And those diversity of voices are all diversity, socioeconomic, class, disability, all of it. Some of our disabilities are hidden as well. It's not, it's not always visible disabilities, it's everything. It's all our access needs. We have to be inclusive, but that have, need to be inclusive is also about our future. So I'm really looking forward to welcoming you all to 2025 as partners, working with our sector, as audience, and hopefully, you know, kind of continuing that journey with us. Our year of culture, 2025, sits in the middle of our 10-year cultural plan. So our impact will create our legacy. So I just want to finish with Welcome Home Sexy. <laughs> Thank you, I feel sexy now. It's beautiful. Shanaz, thank you so much. I, the thing I'll, I'll just add of our relationship with, with both Hull, when we first rocked up there, and then Coventry, although that was a little bit more challenging, it was, it's brilliant. They're just places I go back to all the time now because that infrastructure, that legacy was delivered, especially for the outdoors. So it's, it's wonderful. Uh, yeah, and I was, I was just coming on the, on the train yesterday, uh, and actually because of the strikes, of course, that's why people didn't go through the station, that's of course. Um, but I was just thinking, okay, this will be a journey I'll be doing a lot over the next few years. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that, um, as well as continuing to go back to Hull and Coventry. That's great. Um, thank you, Shanaz. That's, that's terrific. And, and um, I, I love your principles, and uh, I love uh, young people for everybody. That's just perfect. That's absolutely perfect, uh, um, among many other things. That's great. So, going to move on now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so... Now, so just got to do a little, we're doing a little bit around. Tara, are you here? Brilliant. How brilliant. Thank you. You're not next, don't worry. It's okay. But you can sort of come down the front now, Tara. That's great. You can have a little seat. But Lorna is going to be next. So I'm very pleased now to welcome uh, Lorna Reese, who is, is one of our board members. And I'm, come on up, Lorna. Um, and uh, first of all, kind of partnership conversations here. Let me give you a little bit of space there. Don't need post-it notes. Let me get rid of that for you. A little bit of stage management. Um, Lorna is one of our board members. Lorna is uh, an activist and artist in whatever order you wish that to be, and many other things besides. Um, and you don't know this. When we did on the survey, who would you most like to hear from? Number one choice was Lorna. Yes, you won. Yeah, isn't that good? Uh, that's why I put you on first, darling. I know what I'm doing. Um, but uh, that, that's great. So um, very pleased to... Oh, look. Um, look high tech. Um, so, Lorna, you're going to talk a little bit about uh, your work and about partnerships. Are you sliding or not? Yes, you're sliding. It's that one to go forward. Thank you very that much. That one there. And I think it's all working. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, Lorna Reese. Oh, it is working, amazing. Hello everybody and thank you so much for having me. My name is Lorna, I run Lorna Reese Company and Gobbledygook Theatre. I'm a associate artist for Inside Out Dorset and I'm also on the board of Outdoor Arts UK, which Angus has just said. So I call myself a live artist or an outdoor performance artist and some of those terms kind of encompass what I do, but I'm an artist first and foremost. 
Um, we tour nationally and internationally. I've got a background in participation work. And I've done amazing things like I've been able to be the artist in residence for a coastline for the Jurassic Coast. A, a week ago, I made a, a project with 100 people in a village, a tiny village in North Dorset. And um, we made a wassail together. So I get to do these amazing projects too. But our main work, oh yes, it's working, is that we make site responsive work in landscape, inspired by earth sciences and environmental activism. And today I'm here to talk to you about that very, very sexy, sexy topic, town partnerships. Um, but I, I suppose I thought it would, I'd be remiss to not say that we work in partnership all the time. Um, we have deep collaborative partnerships with people that book us, with touring three major works. We've been doing that for years, some of these pieces. This is Ear Trumpet, which was made in 2014 originally, and that was made in partnership with Inside Out Dorset and also the area of outstanding natural beauty in Dorset. Uh, we work with earth scientists and archaeologists and people there. Um, Cloudscapes is actually a piece which is made in partnership with the sky. This is a piece all about the troposphere. It's about climate change, but it's also about the weather. I'm performing with literally whatever the weather's doing at that time. And also geophonic. Oh. Ah. Um, and that's uh, another partnership we made, and actually it's all about a collaboration I had with an amazing earth scientist, Dr. Angina Katwa, and we made that in partnership together. She's kind of my muse, she's an extraordinary woman. And we made that again with Inside Out Dorset, we premiered it there and we're touring that all over the place too. So, I think it's worth saying that there's a lot of people in this room who are already amazing at partnerships. And I think that like many outdoor arts companies, we're really tiny. Lots of us sat here, I can see loads of friends and colleagues. We are really small, and we're a small company too. The day-to-day -day running of the company is just myself and my partner, Adam. And I like to think that we're tiny but noisy. And we can swell, though, on a project-by-project -project basis, and sometimes we employ up to, say, 50 people in a year, sometimes more than that. But our size means that these close artistic relationships are everything to us. We work in partnership with landscapes, scientists, experts, and as you can hear, because I've mentioned them a lot already, we have a really significant partnership with Inside Out Dorset. And I think those type of artistic long-term partnerships with festivals, you know, lots of indoor companies do this with venues, for example, they are ones of really deep importance for us. Um, it's allowed us to grow together. We have a symbiotic relationship. And then we also make lots of work that are sort of small, kind of ninja style, quick projects that are about activism, that are about other stuff. We make these playful commissions because for all of us, especially those of us that are in these small companies, it is all about the hustle, right? We've got to make money, we've got to pay our gas bill, our tax bill, our van, all of these things. So we make strategic choices when we're doing these kind of hustle projects too, when we're working with new partnerships. Um, so I've got some preoccupations. This is how I try to be strategic in that. So I've got preoccupations about feminism and science. Uh, this is a partnership project we did with Barnsley Museums, the National Trust, Northern College at Wentworth Castle Gardens about Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who introduced inoculation to the West. And my art is activism too. I probably am, um, I don't know, an activist first maybe. Depends on the day you might find me. Um, but I think that our culture forms our future. And we have this long history of socially engaged practice. I'm also associate artist for the Change Festival, which is all about hopeful environmentalism. And the last thing I'm just going to tell you about our company is that we do lots of stuff with our audience. It's very joyful, like loads of us in this room. We make participatory work as part of our main art. Um, and that our practice is really collaborative, and it's often about dialogue. We started our company at music festivals. We, we make stuff, it's playful, it's stupid, it's really silly sometimes. And our company motto, it's on the van, it's about disruption and joy. But 
I think loads of us in this room do that all the time. Our work is disruptive in public space, and often it's really bloody joyful. Um, well, I'm going to go back to this topic, sexy. Sexy topic of town partnerships. <laughs> Artists are brilliant at partnerships. Um, and we are natural collaborators. We work in partnerships all the time, but as artists, we are often in quite a prone position. Significant partnerships can take place with a commissioner or a funder, and they generally have the power in those relationships. You might well be working with a funder too, particularly in the outdoor arts, who doesn't have much experience or understanding of negotiating an artistic process. We might all be speaking really different languages. Now, I'm really good at speaking museum, landscape, heritage, and science. When you're doing that artistic hustle, I think you become multilingual. But recently, I found that actually I'm not maybe so good at talking local business. Town council, I find some of that language a little bit more challenging to work with. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a case study about a recent partnership project where we worked in our own town, a place that I live and where I grew up. And it's a project where not everything went right. I feel a little bit vulnerable sharing this to you. Now, I should be just like, oh, aren't we wonderful? But actually, I think sometimes as artists, we should share stuff that went a little bit wonky, a bit awry. So this is Yuletide. This is me and my husband. We are the Holly King and the Ivy Queen of Christchurch. Uh, Christchurch, just to give you some background, is a small market town. It's in the southwest in Dorset, on the edge of, Do of Bournemouth, um, Christchurch and Paul, which is a new conurbation. Until recently, it had the highest Tory majority in the UK. It's one of the oldest demographics per capita in Europe. It's got a very, very white population. It also has two rivers, two castles. The town motto is the infuriatingly mild Christchurch where time is pleasant. <laughs> Obviously, I could not wait to leave it as a teenager. But do you know what? I love it. I've brought my kids up there. My husband is the deputy town crier because we got drunk and decided that would be hilarious. And it is. I'm the consort to the deputy town crier of Christchurch. Um, and I'm really not low profile in my town. My kids go to school there. I was deputy head girl. Like, I, I know everybody. It's great. And there are great benefits in being in a place like that, deeply, deeply embedded in my community. I feel like I'm an undercover artist sometimes. I'm, I, it's an amazing position to be in and really, really powerful. We were approached by Stir Events, who are an events company, and the Christchurch Bid, Business Improvement District, and the Town Council to create a Christmas light switch on event. And to be honest, when you are approached by the town you grew up in to be the king and queen, you cannot possibly say no to that, or I couldn't. Now, there are high street action zones and business improvement districts all over the country. Some bids are really, really keen to spend their money on street cleaning and subsidized parking zones. Others, if you can persuade them, might spend money on events in the town like performing outdoor performance work. And others, well, I mean, also, if they're doing that, then they, you know, they might be working with a brilliant company like Falls Paradise to program events in, who really are very, very good at speaking that language of business improvement districts and town councils and, and shopping centers. Um, the stuff that I'm not so good at speaking. Um, but these bids, well, sometimes they get this sort of imaginative leap and they think, yeah, let's, let's put our money into programming a kind of a light switch on event or something around Christmas. And I think that's an amazing thing and that's a leap of faith that they made to do that. So it was a really powerful thing for our town. But these bids do speak that different language to artists and you are often providing quite a transactional service to them. Now, our town has a really amazing, so it's just pictures of me and Adam, it's hilarious. They look like wedding photos we never had. <laughs> 
Um, our town has this really amazing Saxon history, and Stir Events, um, who were the events company that approached us, had pitched a concept around a Yuletide celebration, which is a word that is used across Europe kind of interchangeably with Christmas. Um, as environmentalists, I suggested we made some of the story about looking after nature as well as the history of the town. So we came up with a sort of nature parable, a, a new old ritual, something that was different from the more normal high street sort of Christmas offer. We got the rugby club involved, local choirs, a, a, you know, a dance school, local primary schools. Um, and rehearsals were really joyful. We had a Yule log that we put up the high street. We made costumes. We wrote songs with people. We did this hilarious photo shoot. We had pictures with the mayor. It was maybe more pantomime than performance art, but I absolutely loved it. And we had this sort of loose narrative of the Holly King and the Ivy Queen and Puck, who was the Lord of Misrule, kind of rising up from the forest to seek out humans and light in the winter and to remind everyone to be good ancestors. And our first hiccup came when one of the shop owners in the bid decided to do a rewrite of this story without telling us. They wanted to make it less Shakespeare and more Disney. And um, we didn't get to see that before it went to the print run, a 50,000 print run, which we then um, felt a little bit upset about, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Um, and it turned out that every decision, be it punctuation or graphic design, was run past this extraordinarily huge, unwieldy group of people, which like town councillors, shop owners, council administrators, which started to feel a bit like art by committee. But these were also people that we were co-creating this event with. In some ways, it was wonderful because they were so invested in what we were making together. So I chose to um, go with it. Just go with it. It's exciting. I'm doing something in Christchurch. And then we started getting some significant sort of social media pushback. Some parishioners and the local vicar had stirred up some strange feeling about the event. Suddenly, any article or social media post was met with one or two people telling us we were doing the devil's work. Batting for Satan. I feel bad saying that in this beautiful cathedral. Um, the town council and the mayor had received dark letters about how we were in league with the new forest witches. <laughs> Spell casting's prohibited in the Bible. I didn't know that, but anyway. Uh, we had lots of, why can't Christmas just be Christmas? Even though what we were actually doing was super traditional. We were called pagans and Satanists and witches. It was kind of funny, but it was actually also upsetting. Now, I have done lots of activism, and I have receive death threats and rape threats, and it's horrible. Um, and I'm, I'm quite good at pushing back online, and I don't mind having spats on social media. But actually, because I was working with my community and young people and potentially vulnerable people, I chose not to engage because that wasn't fair on them. So I started to feel a bit embattled about some of this social media stuff. And the bid got a bit nervous about it too because the story had become about paganism, which was not something we'd even mentioned and not placemaking. And this is me and Remy, who's one of the performers in the piece, on the ducking school. Because we've got a ducking school in, stool in Christchurch, an actual ducking stool, and we sat on it and we really laughed. And we thought about how Christchurch was in 2022 at the time and not the 1750s when we might have been burnt at the stake or ducked. And it turned out we were in the middle of a sort of strange culture war. Um, and it was very little to do with the art we were actually making. People suggesting that um, Christians should have the winter time and maybe pagans get to have Easter online, which I thought the Christian church might have some issues with too. <laughs> Not to mention anyone of any other faith who might wish to celebrate Hanukkah or Diwali or Solstice or any other festival during the really essential winter months for faith. And some of the comments, I have to say, smacked of something also quite ugly. Uh, we were called dirty, we were called woke. I was the only white person on the paid performance team. And it was really hard not to read insinuations in some of this rhetoric. And again, it made us feel vulnerable and it made us feel nervous because this is where I'm in Lidl, in my local supermarket, and I'm thinking, who's written this stuff in my community? So it made me feel sad about the place I live in, and usually I'm so proud of it. 
Now, it was probably only about six people being wildly noisy on social media, but the algorithm on Facebook meant that everyone would see these comments, and I did keep getting stopped in High Street, with mainly people being really outraged on my behalf. And these posts were being made by people that want to ban Halloween, actually, or, or books in schools about wizards. But they were disproportionately listened to, and I definitely lost sleep. However, on the night, 5,000 people turned up. <laughs> they came to see the lights come on. It was a drizzly November evening, and it was really, honestly, seriously amazing. The local vicar even came on stage at the end and told us all about light in darkness, which was beautiful. Santa and the mayor turned the lights on. It was great. I asked everyone how they could consider themselves to be good ancestors. I encouraged everyone to think about nature. The hundred performers had a ball. Adam and I felt it was one of the most surreal things we've ever done in our lives, and we do a lot of surreal stuff. The photos are brilliant, and I've had floods of people asking me about next year or this year coming, you know, how they can be involved, how amazing it was for our town. I still don't know if I feel brave enough to do it again, but I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how we get to. But it was great. So why am I telling you this? I want to say that we don't always get things right in partnership. It's really, really hard work. Artists, even artists with well over 20 years of experience, deep participative practice, don't always get it right. We didn't really have great resource. We didn't build the idea with people at the start because we commissioned. We were commissioned ourselves later in the process. Um, and we should have negotiated a bit more control, I think, at the start. We really should have done that. Um, but I'm going to leave you with a few photos of a piece that I just co-created, actually, an incredibly beautiful process. Oh, funded by um, the Dorset Community Foundation, which was a was sale we made in partnership with a tiny village in North Dorset last week. And this was a celebration which will definitely be performed for decades to come. Partnerships are all about trust. They're about communication and they are about learning and working together. And you know what? It's really hard to make work. It's hard to make work where you live, especially in a town where there are some really strange undercurrents and where you can be accosted in little. But you know what? It really is worth it. It's our job as artists to make change and to be brave and to play and to try new things and push boundaries. I say it often, but our culture forms our future. And we are the culture makers. We push arts and we push things. And that is our job. And it's a powerful job and it's an honor to do. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening to me. <laughs>
Yeah, good. Amazing. Welcome. So Tara's going to tell us about critical mass. Thank you so much for coming and making the effort. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. It's really, really exciting to be in the room here and already to have seen some faces. Personally, I actually started out in kind of outdoor world and carnival arts, so this is really, really nice to be kind of in this room after a kind of mad journey beyond that. So, as you'll see, yes, this is the three of us that are presenting, and I'm going to do my very best impression of uh, and, uh, and become each of them independently in time. Um, so, Orit Azaz um, has sent in a film, so you'll be able to hear what she had to say. I'm going to pretend to be Zoe Golding, MBE, and I'm going to wear that MBE with a lot of pride, actually, today, because I think it's the, the closest I'm going to get to it. Um, so... As Angus said, my name's Tara Lopez, and I have been, for the last couple of years, senior producer um, on Birmingham 2022 Festival. And in particular, my role was really looking after a project called Critical Mass, which you're going to hear a little bit more about. But Critical Mass sat within a six-month festival, which was obviously attached to the kind of Commonwealth Games itself. And for us, actually, partnerships was always really core to everything that we were doing as, as, as Birmingham 2022 Festival because we knew we were rocking up this big loud circus and then we were going to disappear again. So in order to have any kind of long-term impact and legacy, we had to work in partnership with everyone who was on the ground. In order to actually just get on and do the job, we needed to work with partners who understood the local communities, who really could help us to actually connect with those groups and audiences that we needed to. So for us, partnership was always central to everything. Critical Mass took that to another level and you'll kind of get, get a bit more of a sense of that from Orit speaking in terms of the way that we actually governed the project so it was all done in partnership which at times was sticky and difficult but at times was was pure magic um, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to let us go on to Orit if that's okay so she can set up just what this partnership looked like hello I'm so and hopefully we'll get sound Sorry I can't be with you today. I'd like to set the scene for the story that Zoe and Tara will tell you about Critical Mass, particularly in the context of Bradford 2025. Critical Mass was a partnership between the Birmingham 2022 Festival, that's the cultural programme of the Commonwealth Games, and the Dance Development Leaders Group, DDLG for short. DDLG is an informal network of now more than 70 dance professionals and organisations from across the West Midlands region. They're people who are passionate about inclusion, learning and inspiring people of all ages, especially young people, to dance. The DDLG was originally convened over five years ago by Arts Connect, the bridge organisation for the region. Together, the group explored priorities for development and the potential for collaboration. We asked what could only be achieved by working together that could never be achieved by anyone individually. We adopted a creative inquiry approach, agreeing some questions to explore and learning through doing and reflecting rather than just talking. A vision emerged for an ambitious project that would make the most of the opportunity of the Commonwealth Games, then several years away. For the avoidance of doubt, we called it the audacious, ambitious, collaborative, region-wide, live and digital, outdoor youth dance project. And this became the title of all emails and documents. When the Birmingham 2022 team began their work in 2020, in lockdown, the title of our email and the nature of the DDLG partnership caught their attention. They supported a pilot project Beyond Borders in 2021 to explore inclusive, integrated practice. And here's what happened next. Thank you, Orit. Um, so yes, next, and this is great actually, I can let everyone else just do the work for me. We're going to show a film um, which kind of captures what critical mass was so that you can try and get a sense of that for yourselves. <laughs> Hi, my name is Angel, I'm from Solly Hall and I'm currently a performing arts student at college. So my name is Sarah, I'm from Solly Hall and currently I'm a teaching assistant. Hello, my name is Jason, I'm from Moxley, the Black Country and I'm currently a student training to be a professional actor at East 15 in London. So Critical Mass is a project that started last summer 
and invited a group of up to 300 young people to join us over 14 months of rehearsing and performing in some of the biggest moments of 2022. Critical Mass is a dance and movement project. It's an inclusive collective made up of people with and without disabilities who aim to show what genuine inclusion can look like at mega events. Spirit of 2012, who's the legacy funder from the London 2012 Olympics, very generously offered to fund the project. So they funded us £1 million to actually be able to make Critical Mass a reality. What I've seen is an astonishing group of people who may have had no experience before really grab that. I've seen people's understanding of dance grow and I've seen people's understanding of themselves and what they can achieve be sort of smashed apart really for the good. Inclusion is a fundamental necessary human right. So regardless of race, sex, gender, disability, everybody has a right to be included and barriers to be removed so inclusion can happen and they can be involved and part of something, part of society, part of the world, part of community. So inclusion is a really vital component to health and happiness. Critical mass has had a really profound impact on some of the participants like transformation wise and not only have they made friends, been fully immersed and involved in something and fully included, they've been able to really represent themselves and be who they are and the impact of that can be life changing. I feel like everyone deserves to have the chance to perform whether you're able bodied, you're not able bodied, it doesn't matter what religion, race, gender, sexuality, whatever you are, everyone deserves to have the chance to perform in front of someone and I think just having it open and making sure that everyone feels included is so important. There's been such a transformative element to this project um, alongside the dance and movement that is truly inspirational and shows what can come out of projects like this that aim to put people first. I just felt that my confidence has just grown a lot over the last eight months. It feels like I can be free, I can be expressive in my own way and just be an individual. Wow. What I hope for the future is that the next major events, whatever they might be, are able to take the learning that we've built through critical mass and make sure that they do things better than we have here, make sure that the work around pushing inclusivity keeps going forward so that this project and all of the work that's gone in really has a change nationally, maybe even internationally, on how people put on large scale events. Critical Mass to me as an artist has really empowered me to keep championing what I believe in, in that when you bring people together for a shared vision, and especially through movement, extraordinary things can happen. For me, it's shown that if you stick together, the, the impossible is possible. It makes me more confident in what I can do. I, it made me realize what I'm capable of. One word I would use to sum up my journey of critical mass, incredible. It's been emotional. 
It's been an emotional journey, I think. We've, we've all learned so much. We've all put so much kind of love and energy into this project. So yeah, it's been a, a long journey, but a beautiful one. It's been great. Everyone here has been superlative, if that was a word to describe them all. Can't thank them all enough for helping me get my confidence back. Critical mass in one word. Can I use two? It's the best. <laughs> it's quite euphoric. It's quite overwhelming in the best possible way because there's so many, it's not one word. It's quite euphoric. Overwhelmingly euphoric. That's two. Um, it's life changing. Still two. It's unforgettable. Thank you so much. I think that says way more than I ever could stand in front of you and say. And actually, it takes me a second always to kind of catch myself because I think the emotion is still really strong um, in this project. So now, I am Zoe Golding, MBE. Um, and I've got long brown hair and lovely dimples. So just imagine that. Um, and bear with me because I got these notes just before I was leaving the house. I quickly printed them out. So I've not read them, but it'll be fine. So this is what Zoe wanted to say, and I think Zoe really wanted to convey some of the, the emotion and actually the experience of her as an artist leading this project, which, as I say, at times was challenging, at times was beautiful. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about my role as artistic lead in this epicness and some of my reflections in a letter I've written to the next lead artist of the next big thing, whatever that might be. So the role. First up, quickly I realised and I invented a new role title for myself, which was Artistic Negotiator. Which when doing something like this, you know, it's about enabling someone else's artistic vision to be realized with an integrated cast, whilst constantly championing our participant and dance team voice, needs, and priorities within the process. It was about artistically producing and directing a co-created show with 150 plus people. She had one shot, um, at a very fast meeting in a coffee shop to insist on what we needed to be our best in the opening ceremony performance with no compromise. To unexpectedly lead the R&D and devising the movement content with the team for the opening ceremony, thanks to COVID. Curating live sites, um, critical mass events, which was about empowering the local groups to perform what they wanted. Um, oh, sorry, slide before, we've got some images. Um, which you can see, sorry, it's not, not that big, but you can kind of see the different um, performances that she's talking about here. Um, held off the opening of one of the live sites areas because tech delays earlier in the day, out of our control, had compromised critical mass tech time, and there was no way after 18 months of championing what inclusive practice needs, compromise was happening now. So she really had to kind of champion all the way through, not just the art, but the people that we were working with and actually what it meant to be working with this integrated cast. Discovering and teaching others what it means to be truly inclusive in, in the role of a kind of mass rehearsal director. And the words, shall we have a meeting about that, make Zoe shiver. There is so much that she could say about this project, team learning, be aware that removing one or the most obvious barrier to access does not mean your job is done. What you are doing is creating an environment of trust which allows people to really bring themselves, which means more complexities can follow. And when we fully support people, even more achievement is reached and you become that support network. Surround your team with as much support as you do the participants and that's something that for us was always a big learning curve as we, as we pushed through. Invest time and resources into really knowing who is going to be in the room. This is everyone from participants to leaders to the person from the local press turning up with a camera. That kind of knowledge is really, really key. So this is Zoe's letter, love letter, to whoever might embark on doing this next. Dear lead artist, welcome to an exploration of yourself and others through the passion of your art form. Be ready to feel empowered, vulnerable, nervous, frustrated, excited, and proud. The world of inclusive practice is vast, and each encounter will give you a new perspective. You will learn and lead all at the same time, so be kind to yourself when it seems hard. 
use positive motivational methods and collective responsibility to create a sense of self-discipline from within. Keep expectations high, your participants deserve it. Amidst the mass, see the small moments of success. Sometimes those are the most potent. You will see people rise against adversity time and time again. Be ready for a hell of a lot of emotional labor that never makes its way into planning spreadsheets and fulfillment that will last a lifetime. Your role is to hold a positive space where the I can do it mantra leads so that when it may all seem a bit much, you are the grounding voice and energy that allows people to feel safe. And above all, remember to trust the process, trust your vision, and just be you. So that's what Zoe wanted to share with you all. And now, back to me. Next slide, please. Thank you. So you've seen what the project is. You've heard a bit about the kind of partnership environment that it was, it was actually created in. And you've heard a bit from Zoe about how it felt to be delivering a project like that. I wanted to leave you with actually, what are we doing now? Um, and how can all of this be useful for hopefully the sector as we, as we push forward? Um, from day one, we were all, always really, really clear that critical mass couldn't just be about the 12 or so months leading up to the opening ceremony. Um, the impact had to be future focused. And the work we did here had to have some tangible ripple effects out into the sector and the world of major events. So even though the project came to an end publicly in September last year, we've still been hard at work to ensure that the legacy ambitions can be realised. And largely that consists of three things which you can see up on the screen here. So number one was really about keeping that momentum going. You know, we'd got participants used to turning up every week. They had friends, they had created a community and actually to pull that away immediately just didn't feel quite right. So we set up a softer landing program, which was about a reduced number of sessions, but trying to keep some level of provision in place across the West Midlands that was free, that was inclusive and that that trust, trust had already been built up because actually people were saying, I want to keep dancing, but I just don't trust going down to that other dance class. I don't know how I'm going to be received. So that's one thing that we've been really, really kind of focused on. Um, and we're looking at the minute at funding that can support that beyond kind of March, April this year. The second thing has been about bedding in those skills. So there were a lot of skills, a lot of learning, a lot of knowledge that was kind of developed through the delivery team, the producing team, dance artists, support workers, everyone that was up close with this project. And Dance Development Leaders Group, who Orit is the kind of convener for, and she talked a little bit about them at the beginning, are really um, leading on a project which is, again, a really sexy title, Critical Mass, What's Next? Um, to basically look at actually how we can start, you know, sharing some of those skills. So they're looking at kind of buddying up with different producers, different artists in different areas, sharing all of this practice, sharing what we've learned and seeing how it can impact on a kind of practitioner level of in the room, how do you lead that space, as well as an organizational level in terms of the things that need to be considered in kind of longer term strategies. And finally, um, a big part of what my job has been over the last few months has been about sharing that learning. Um, so we've been re working really, really hard to try and capture the learning first, which was a minefield, and put it into kind of some sort of format that, that would be useful and usable for people. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we have two things that might be of interest to people in the room. The first is the evaluation report, which you can find on the website. This really just tells the story of what happened, gives you a sense of the impact and some of those kind of key findings that came along the way. The second thing, which um, Zoe, Orit, others kind of around the project were really passionate about was putting that learning into something that could be a really useful tool. You know, an evaluation report is great, I'd love it if you read it. They're actually quite good. But let's be honest, once you've read halfway through an evaluation report, you're probably going to shelve it. And, you know, it's, it's not, they're never the most exciting pieces of work. So we really didn't want that to be the case with this learning because we know how valuable it could be. So we've been working with the audience agency to pull together a playbook, which is basically all of that learning kind of put in a sense of, okay, if you were going to pick this up and try and do something, whether it's on this scale or on a smaller scale, Here's some of the things that we wish we had known. If someone had handed me a manual of how do you do critical mass, this is what I would have really liked to see. It's been positioned largely from the position of kind of major mass scale events because that's what we did. But we really hope that there's bits and pieces that actually everyone could pull out of that, that they would kind of find useful. 
So if you're interested in that at all, that would be out from kind of week commencing the 20th of February. And the best way probably is just to drop me an email. So my details are on there and possibly on a list somewhere else. Fabulous. Thank you very much. So you'll be able to kind of get access to that resource as well. So thank you so much for hearing about our story. It's really a joy to be able to come out and tell people about it now and hope that's useful. Thanks. So uh, Tara's not, not here for questions towards the end of the day, so grab her at lunchtime. I'm not, I'm not on. There we are, I'm on now. Yeah? Yeah, here we go. Great. Right, break time. Time for coffee? Yeah? Then we are back for an hour after that. So can I just ask... We on that one? Yeah. Um, so uh, what we're doing straight afterwards is a thing called opportunity pitching. That will be at 12 o'clock. It's really quick. Uh, the first lot is David Morgan without walls. It's going to be Pete talking about the Streetwise program at 101, Ajay talking about the Mellor Partnership, Joe talking about Fool's Paradise, and Derek talking about Tur Talking Birds Difference Engine. Really quick. So they're pitches that are not artist pitches. They're pitches that are kind of opportunities and things we should all know about. The first lot. So can I ask those people to be at the front, obviously, uh, when we get back? And also the panel for the Bradford discussion Please come straight back in. Now it's coffee. We'll be back in here at 12 sharp. Thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers. If you're using the BSL, please have a word with the signers, which just so we know. Thank you to, uh, to Lizzie and Katrina. If you're using BSL, please contact them to know that they're doing the right sort of thing. Thank you. Cool. I don't know. Do I think I've got it. No, it's just going straight off. It's died. <laughs>